Swim Things in Blue Springs, your one-stop shop for all things swim. Pools, spas, patio furniture, swimwear, and accessories. Visit them in Blue Springs or at www.swimthings.com. Sometimes in practice, everybody's like, my arms feel like marble. My arms feel like cement. <laughs> my arms feel like bricks. My arms, right, you know how that game goes, right? right? And so the same thing with uh, in swimming, um, uh, you know, when it's not, when you're not doing that is this sense of like, you're not swimming, but swimming's doing you. And you're kind of aware that there's all this splashing going around, but like my soul would go into a sliver and I would just like be pivoting, you know, when I was swimming on a, right, on a stick almost. And, um, but everything would be calm and Right. And, and mm-hmm. you just live for those moments of just totally in the zone, mm-hmm. totally mm-hmm. in the zone. Yeah. Yeah. And I've often said, I don't know if you can have those amazing times without also having the, my arms feel like marble right time. like to welcome everyone to the journey. Um, I have myself, Jean Marie Madison or Jean Madison. Um, I'm one of the assistant swimming coaches here at TCU. And I have Jennifer Alshire here as well. Um, one of my former uh, high school coaches uh, for Lisa yep. West. And um, we also have Nancy. And Nancy has done a phenomenal of different things, you know, in her life and in her journey. And so we're really kind of excited to get you started and um, kind of ask some questions, get to know you a little bit better, and we'll kind of go with that, okay? That sounds great. Looking forward to it. Awesome. Well, Nancy, just tell us your story. Tell us a little bit about you. Um, you know, I know you're kind of born and raised in in the Midwest in Iowa City, but kind of just give me a background of you and, and tell us a little bit about you. Sure. Um, well, most people want to know, like my whole life began when I started swimming. (laughs) Yes. Um, So when I was two years old, we left Iowa and moved to, um, my dad was a professor at the University of Florida. My dad's an orthopedic surgeon. And for those of you who are elite athletes, that was like my, my, my secret weapon was being able to have somebody right there tell me, is this one of those rest it or you know, right? I just can't tell you how helpful it was to have a dad as an orthopedic surgeon, even though he did spines, he didn't do shoulders, which is usually what swimmers get. Uh, anyway, so when I was 11, when I was seven, my, um, my family was in Gainesville and um, my first coach ever was Eddie Reese, yep. who's the head coach at University of Texas. So, yep. I mean, how lucky, Eddie was probably 22 or so. And he was just getting started in coaching. And um, he used to tell my mom, you know, I really think Nancy could be really good, but I'm not really sure you're the right kind of parent for a a (laughs) world-class athlete. Um, His wife, Eleanor, was my gymnastics coach. And at the time, I actually liked gymnastics a lot more. Um, but right. So between the two of them and they, they, even back then they were talking about like, oh, she's going to be an Olympian in this, or she's going to be in a, right. It was that, that kind of talk kind of got started early. Um, when I was 11, my family moved to Jacksonville, Florida and Eddie's brother was there, Randy Reese. And yeah. Randy's the one who, um, I mean, Eddie's idea was don't push her she's a talent and if you push her she's going to quit the sport so my mom at one point I think said to him like I think Nancy's close to getting the 10 under record and um, I never broke the record um, but I did stay in the sport and you know he never even told me about it I didn't even learn about it until much later but Randy didn't have that philosophy at all (laughs) he was like let's go go and frankly I probably got put on to the 
A team probably sooner than I should have. Um, you know, I was 11 and most of the other people on the team were, you know, like teenage, like 14, 15, right? Like that. Um, I made senior nationals when I was 12 years old. Nice. Wow. Your nationals? <laughs> yeah. Um, and as a parent now, you know, my son is 20 and my girls are 15. And now I can see like, wow. Um, and uh, I was the national age group record holder for 12 year olds. And by the time I was 14, I was number one in the world for all women um, and was American record holder. That's so, um, yeah, 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 that was for sure, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Um, so then um, at, when I was 15, I, um, Randy moved to, um, he moved to uh, University of Florida to go be the head swimming coach there. And so I followed him. And so I lived away from home and, um, and trained under him. And I made the 1980 Olympic team, but you might remember we boycotted those Olympics. Yep. It's ancient history for most of you, but uh, <laughs> yeah, not for me. Um, at the time, actually, I was in favor of the boycott because I thought that we were preventing World War III. I, I mean, I, I bought hook, line, and sinker, this idea that Carter was foisting on us, that you know we had to do something about the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. And um, you know, it wasn't until I went to college that I realized, hmm, I don't think that's quite true. Um, so um, I, um, but at the time, I, I have to say that it probably helped a little bit to not get to go to the Olympics by seeing, seeing that I was doing something virtuous. My brother is two years older than I am and he had to register for the draft. So, you know, it was, remember we had just gotten out of, um, out of um, Vietnam mm -hmm. and I didn't want to repeat of that either, right? So anyway, so, yeah, so uh, um, I know I was really lucky that I got a full scholarship to Duke University. And if I had just been a couple of years older, I would not have gotten a college scholarship, no matter what my credentials were or what, what records or anything. Um, so I kind of lucked out in, in that way. And I'm the, uh, you know, so went to Duke and uh, uh, really got supported, not just as an athlete, but as a human being when I was there, I was very, very lucky that my, um, that Duke did not just see me as kind of, um, you know, um, you know, what can I do for them? Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and I think that's really important. That's important as a female. It's important yeah. as a person, as an individual to be seen as something other than just an athlete, right? It's so uh, true. Eventually that's gone and you mm -hmm. have to be something else. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I was I was very lucky. So you probably heard that part of my story. My sophomore year in college, I was out for a run between two campuses and I was raped. So there was a big guy there who came and he was coming towards me. And I did have little alarm bells going off in my head, but I kind of told myself like, come on, this is Duke. Yeah. And um, so, and he kind of stopped me to ask me a question of being the nice Southern girl that I was like, of course I was going to be helpful. Mm -hmm. And he said, where is Duke University? And I was like, well, that's weird. Cause you just came from East campus over here. Like there was no, there's no other side street. Right. And um, so that's when he gripped, lunged and grabbed me and sort of centrifugal force sort of swung me around and at the time, if you all just like Google, like Nancy Hogshead muscle, and I was huge. I mean, I was unusually strong, even for Olympic swimmers. It was probably me and Jill Sterkel. And, um, but I was, you know, on the bell-shaped curve of strong, muscular women, like there's Nancy Hogshead right there, way over there. And um, I, it wasn't even in a close fight. Um, and... Um, so when I got out of the woods, I, I stopped a car going in the opposite direction. I mean, it was two and a half hours. I stopped a car going in the opposite direction so that, um, the, and I kind of made him promise boy scout 
that he wasn't going to rape me. I mean, I was already kind of right, right. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and um, and and I have to say, I'm just so grateful of the feminists that came before me because the police and the school just could not have been nicer to me. And if I was had been raped in another country, I would have had to marry that guy. Yeah. If I was raped in just 20 years earlier, they would have said, you know, what were you doing wrong? What, um, mm-hmm. you know, you know, wh- why didn't he have a bodyguard r- running with you? Or I don't know what what I could have done. But, um, you know, I just I really like I was very very grateful that people believed two things that were really important. One is that I was raped right? Mm -hmm. That I wasn't making Mm -hmm. it up. And number two is I was really lucky that they also believed in the depth of my emotional harm. Mm -hmm. So they weren't trying to tell me like, oh, just get over it. Like, can't you just, right? And um, if any of you all have been through a really low point in your life, it really makes you a very much, much, much more empathetic person. Mm -hmm. Because um, before then, I would have said to me, like, come on, buck up right? Just get to sleep. Just, you know, just why are you so scared all the time? Right. I would have been like, there's no reason here to be afraid. Um, But being in that situation and having a reputation as being tough and having a reputation as being a hard worker, um, I really couldn't help it. If, If you've to have PTSD, it's like the rug gets pulled out from under you. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever been through something traumatic, but, um, like you, like how you normally feel, you know, about things really gets changed and you so desperately want to go backwards in time, but I just couldn't. And what I wanted more than anything was for, you know, a 40 year old to say it happened to me and I too went through a time where I couldn't sleep and life was a little crazy and but I made it out okay and you're gonna make it too and right but I I couldn't find anybody right Right. I would like go and look hard into biographies and things and like who's been through this but the people who are writing about it were quite hot mad and so I wasn't I wasn't like I was like okay I I get the white hot mad (laughs) I'm there I wanted like right after somebody had been through that right? Who, but usually, frankly, my experience is most women, as soon as the white hot mad and the, the upset and the whatnot is like, they so want to get over it that they really don't revisit it. Mm -hmm. And more, more women, my age, more women, you know, 40 years old and up need to be speaking out about it because it is one in four of us. And because we really can be making it so much easier on the next woman who's in college, who does get raped. Right. Well, and I think that there is, there's been a lot of progress in uh, like trauma-informed care. And as a high school counselor myself, um, Mm -hmm. with a lot of trauma-informed care training and dealing with students who've been through traumatic experiences, um, I think that's a growing area. And I think that um, it's a good, it's a good thing that we've made some progress in that area for sure. Right. I've been an expert witness in a case where the school really piled onto this kid. So I think that honestly, they didn't believe her when she said that she was raped as at a fraternity party in the stairwell and that she hurt her back. So I, I think frankly, is that so they didn't believe that it happened. So then when she started having like normal trauma symptoms, it kind of looks like as you can probably attest to it kind of looks like somebody is acting out. Mm-hmm. right? Like they don't go to class. They don't go to practice. Yep. They um, sleep in a lot. They go party a lot. They drink too much. They, right. Mm-hmm. So it looks like just, you know, out of control kid when really what it is, is like, they just, they're going to do that. <laughs> it's, just, like that is, it's like their coping mechanism. It's like, yes. they're it's honestly like their cover up to, you know, I guess smooth what they're really feeling. Um, and sometimes they need that numbness to honestly try to forget and not live in it. And so I, I understand that, you know, um, and I, and I can see that in whether it's an athlete or whether it's a, just a regular student, um, or a person. So, um, that's good that you mentioned that for sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, but, but, but this school in particular just had very little empathy for mm -hmm. what, what she was going through. So they made her uh, go to physical therapy for her back four days a week. They made her go to tutoring because she wasn't doing well. They made her check in for every single, they kind of like piled on. And then they took away, they said, well, you're not on the team. So her one source of community that she had, they yanked that away. So I, I just, I felt for her and it just makes you appreciate when you see all these other situations. So Duke redshirted me. I didn't swim for a whole year mm -hmm. and they let me keep my scholarship. And, um, um, you know, it was, it was, you know, I had been so, training so hard for so long up until that time. Like, even if I hadn't been raped, like my body needed it. I needed a break from that kind of training because back in, I don't know what, how, how many yards you guys are training now, but back in my day, I, 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 I like hit it like the worst time of like the peak 20,000 yards a day for a decade. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's 800 laps. That's uh, for a little under 13 miles. I mean, it's a lot of swimming back and forth. So um, even not, you're not doing that much anymore, right? Oh, no. <laughs> I, no. I I wouldn't Especially even say at the high school, school level. Yeah, I was right. going to say probably not at the high school level, but at the college level. I mean, we we just can't, you know, with the twenty hour rule and and there's a lot yeah. of you know things. I mean, I coach a distance program here, so I'd like to be able to push it a little bit more, but I don't think I would ever do twenty k in one day. Um, that's 10, oh 10 grand in a, in a practice. <laughs> There's no way we're going to do that. Um, and I don't really see yeah. the point of it, you know, my philosophy of coaching. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I think in that era and that time, I mean, it, it was like, go, go, go pound, 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 um, quite often. So yeah. I think it's work smarter, not harder. <laughs> yes, you're yeah. exactly right. Yeah. No, I know one thing that I love watching now is, um, like, you know, on, on um, Instagram in particular, there's these really good sites of um, just underwater push-offs now and, you know, how people do turns now and just their technique. Oh my gosh, is it ever beautiful? Do you guys get as upset as I do when you watch commercials and they don't hire a swimmer to be in the water? <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Oh my God. It just drives me like, <laughs> so like I just can't stand looking at it. Yeah. yeah. I kind of have to like look away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I do want to ask a question, you know, going through that traumatic time in your life. And, yeah. you know, that was probably right around 1981, 1982, right? And exactly. you still went to the Olympics at 84. And so right. talk to me how you really got back into the swing of things and how you got, maybe you never got over it. Maybe you found a way to kind of, you know, get through it. And so kind of talk to me about that and, and talk me through that because I, I find that so interesting because coming yeah. back from that and winning three gold medals and a silver, I mean, that's amazing to me. Um, so just tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I think that it goes to show what survivors can do if they are if they get supported, mm -hmm. right? So let's go through all the ways that I had to get supported. Number one is I had to move dorm rooms so that I was living someplace that that wasn't surrounded by woods, right? But I was living in like the most coveted place to live, right? It's called Maine West. Um, I um, um, like I had to drop two classes. It was after the time of drop ad and on my transcript, they don't exist. They just took them off. That's and good. then because I got into two car accidents, bang, bang, I had never, never been in a car accident before, never one since, but that just goes to show you, you know, how things were not normal. Um, I, um, I didn't take my finals, uh, after my second car accident, I literally got my car, went to, um, the airport and went home. Mm -hmm. And, um, so my, um, uh, I didn't take my finals until like February of the next year. And, but you would never know that look at my, looking at my transcript. Okay. So, but here's the main way that like, when I think of how nice Duke was to me is, um, so there's two places to park. One was right close to my dorm room, which frequently 
filled up very quickly. And the other one, we called it Guam. So it was kind of really far away. And to get there, to walk, I had to go walk through woods. Mm -hmm. And um, Mm -hmm. so in my mind, I was like, well, just not today. You know, I'm just going to choose to park illegally over here. So I ended up with this huge stack of parking tickets. So I went to go pay the parking tickets. That was it, pay the parking tickets. And they said, Nancy, why do you have all these parking tickets? And I said, well, you know, I kind of explained the situation. And so not only did they forgive the parking tickets that I wasn't even asking for, they um, gave me a special parking pass that allowed me to park pretty much anywhere I wanted to on campus. That's nice. So, right. So that's kind of right. So, and my, my, when I went, so after that uh, sophomore year, so I didn't swim that sophomore year, uh, my coach says to me, he was telling me, he's like, you're going to win gold in 84. And I remember thinking, you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, he goes, listen, Nancy, just, just come show up at the meets. You don't have to practice. You don't have to do anything. And I thought like, for 10 grand a year, because that's how much, you know, the scholarship used to cost. Now it's like 80 grand uh, because I have a son that is there right now. And uh, so, um, um, you know, great. I'll just show up at the meets and it won't bother me to get second place. I'll be fine. And um, so, you know, he's like, okay, you know, just get in and, and go. And sure enough, you know, I, it just sort of being in the water and experiencing that giftedness again, and that sense of like, I'm supposed to be here. And that sense of, um, I mean, I think it's available to almost every athlete is that sense of like, right, this, um, you know, when things are going right. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so, you know, you know, after the first race I won and pr- pretty much I think my body had just gotten rested. And you guys have probably already seen this mm-hmm. in other athletes like who take an extended break and they get back in, they go faster than they think that, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, so I was like, well, let me just do a couple workouts. Okay, well, let me just do a couple more, right? And sort of before I knew it, you know, and so I actually, then I took uh, that semester off to go um, the in my, the spring of, of 1983. And I did nothing but train for a year and a half. So I took some three semesters off. My, my dad says to me, he goes, let me get this straight. You're going to give up a full scholarship. You're going to go out to California and go train. And this is for a swim meet. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's about the size. That's exactly yeah. what I want to do. And uh, he's like, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but I, and I just have to say, here. Uh-oh. Go ahead. Oh, no, no. I was going to say that um, when I did get back into swimming, so there's a great book that I highly recommend called The Body Keeps the Score. I mean, if you're interested in trauma at all, The Body Keeps the Score. And he talks about oh, all these yes. pharmacological things that you can do to, to help recover from trauma. And it turns out, like I was reading this, like I did that. So one of them was um, um, I would... Um, I would, uh, I would be swimming and thinking I would, I would put myself back in, I was, you know, where I was confronting him and um, my rapist in the woods. And, um, but this time I had a machete and right. And so, and, and apparently that is a therapy, right. That you can rewire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like it gives you much more of a sense of control and not feeling like you're out of control. Right. But I, cause, cause what I noticed is when I would get really emotional like that, I went faster. Ah, Right. So it was a way to go. As soon as I, like, I realized, right. That it was making me go faster. And it also had this weird effect of calming me down, like, like in calming me down intuitively. Right. And then second of all, um, uh, there's another thing, uh, in that, um, apparently very, very hard practice helps calm the mind down. So that's, I know, I know. So really, really hard work, um, helps, with PTSD and it helps, right? And so people like they work to exhaustion. So that's exactly what I was doing was working to exhaustion and and also kind of getting that sense that I was in control of my life, that my rapist was not in control of my life. Um, 
Yeah, it really did. It really did help. And plus that, I mean, I, I do in my swimming career, and I'm sure you all feel the same way, but my swimming career, um, there is something of giftedness and this connection with God when you're training. And this, you know, it doesn't happen all the time, obviously, you know, because sometimes in practice, everybody's like, my arms feel like marble. My arms feel like cement. <laughs> my arms feel like bricks. My arm, right. You know how that thing goes, right? right? <laughs> And so the same thing with, uh, in swimming, um, uh, you know, when it's not, when you're not doing that is this sense of like, you're not swimming, but swimming's doing you. And you're kind of aware that there's all this splashing going around, but like my soul would go into a sliver and I would just like be pivoting, you know, when I was swimming on a, right, on a stick almost. And, um, but everything would be calm and, Right. And, and mm -hmm. you just live for those moments of just totally in the zone, mm -hmm. totally mm -hmm. in the zone. Yeah. Yeah. And I've often said, I don't know if you can have those amazing times without also having the, my arms feel like marble, right. Times. 